Okay. So December, we finally made it in the beekeeping journey to December. And there are a couple of quick things I want to touch on before we get started with the material. Um, our early dates for our bees are uh, booking up really quickly. So if you want bees in early April, go ahead and get those booked, whether it's the complete hive that we sell or our Texas 5000 nooks, our really gentle golden Cordovans or our marked queens. Uh, those early April dates are booking up quickly. So if you're interested in getting bees next year, then I would really encourage you to go and get those booked as quickly as possible, especially so you can snag those early dates. Something I'm really excited about, we are now selling package bees and we will ship those nationwide and the shipping is free. So uh, a lot of folks that have top bar hives or if you had a hive that died out over the winter months um, and you don't need all the frames that come with a nook or you don't need a complete hive, a lot of those folks like a package of bees that they can dump right into um, a hive. And so we're selling uh, three pound packages. And so it's a lot of bees in here. It's got a mated queen. We actually have a, um, whoops, we actually have a late March ship date and an April ship date on these packages. Um, and they come in these really cool new B bus is what they're called, plastic shipping containers. And uh, they're way safer for the bees in shipment. And then they're 185 and that includes free shipping. And so uh, we'll ship them right to your front door. So you can check those out on our website as well. Um, Sherry, do you want to jump on really quickly and fill us in on what's going on in the free magazine this month? I can. Can you hear me? Sure can. Well, I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen real quick Go for uh, it. so that I can show the magazine. We're going to see if this works. Um, and if it doesn't, then everybody can laugh. We can all laugh together. <laughs> got it? No problem. So look at this. Hey, you got it. You got it. Great. Is that great? Okay, so this month's issue is out. Just went out, what was it, yesterday? Day before yesterday. Um, and it's a great one. It's, a, it's the Merry Christmas edition. Um, for folks that haven't seen this, go to www.texasbeesupply.com. And this is the best publication out there. I'm, I'm going to just say I'm a little bit partial because Blake and I are, are co-editors, but this is get inside a magazine and make it work for you. Um, so if I see this little spot where I can click on something, look what happens. All of a sudden, I'm going to go and I'm going to be uh, on the videos uh, on the YouTube page for Texas Bee Supply. That easy. That easy. And then I can click back and go to the magazine. It's so interactive. If I want to see a picture that Blake has posted in one of his articles, there it is. I want to see it up close. No biggie push the screen again, it goes away. I, I just love it. it. It's innovative. It works with you. Um, there's those nukes that you were just talking about, Blake. But it's a great magazine. We Every every aspect of each, uh, I'm gonna say, timely uh, article that you can imagine is in there each month. And we, we are having a blast doing it. We're mm -hmm. having a blast doing it. We have a question, honey, of how do we get the magazine? How do we get the magazine? Well, if you go to www.texasbeesupply.com and in the menu bar, it's going to say uh, Texas Bee Supply Monthly Magazine, and you can get all of the past issues. This was our issue six, so uh, you'll get them there. You'll get them there. So that was a good question. Um, you can also do a, a, I can't remember, Blake, help me, is not contact us. You can request to get it in your inbox. Mm -hmm. Of course, anytime you become a customer of Texas Bee Supply, you'll automatically start getting those emails and it'll have that in it. Yeah, and it's also on our website. So all you have to do is go to our website and it's published every month on our website and it's yeah. right there on the homepage. But I love it. It's a good magazine. Of course, I'm partial, but that worked. I'm good. I'm done. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to take the screen, take the screen back over if I can, if I can do that. Here we go. Bear with us just for a sec. And that, that magazine, it really is. It's, it's a lot of fun to write, but it's, it's even more fun to, uh, to read. And so we try to stay really, really practical in it. That's always a huge focus for us. And, uh, so hopefully you find it practically applicable for you. Okay, let's jump into December tips. So winter is finally here. Now, if you're 
uh, I saw someone in the chat box say that you're uh, they're up in Minnesota. So if you're up in Minnesota, winter's been here for a little while. <laughs> um, if you're down in uh, you know southern Texas, then you're like, uh, what winter? Um, but overall, really across the the whole country, um, it was a fairly warm December. I mean November. I mean November was especially the start of it. We kind of had some early cold fronts. But it, it stayed relatively warm um, across November, especially if you're in southeast Texas. Uh, but even in north Texas and other parts of the country, it, it was a pretty warm November overall. So the bees, we're going to talk about some implications of that in a minute, but the bees definitely stayed uh, warmer overall. Winter blooms, not much going on. Uh, there is, there is a, before the freezes that we started getting here in Texas the last couple of weeks, um, I was actually still seeing a bit of a pollen trickle. Occasionally, breeze is still bringing in a little bit of pollen. By and large, everywhere the, the pollen flow is about wrapped up. So not a lot of pollen coming in. Blooms are really done other than the very rare sporadic survivor bloom out there. Pollen flows over, nectar flows over. We're kind of going into the, the long, cold winter months that, that we'll be in for a little while now. So current conditions, kind of what I'm seeing out there in the bees, you know, the cold temperatures are really rapidly causing a reduction in brood production uh, or an end to brood production. So we'll talk about that a little bit later tonight. Some hives in some areas still have a couple frames of brood. Um, other areas, it's completely over. And I'll show you some pictures of what I've been seeing out in my bees over the past week or two. There's, like I said, a very slight pollen trickle in some areas, but not much going on at all. So it's, it's very, very minimal. Um, overall, again, it was a warm November. Um, There's a longer, longer broodering than I expected into November. And, be, and there was still a pollen trickle through a lot of November. So it's been, it's been a little more long lasting than I had expected. Uh, you know, we started November really cold. And so I was like, oh, it's over, it's finished. But then it got really warm. So but seems like we're kind of in the cold now for, for a little while. Overall, for much of the South, a warm winter is projected. Who knows, right? I mean, projecting the weather has always been a bit tricky, but in general, it does seem as though it could be shaking, shaping up to be a warm winter. And we're gonna talk about the implications of that in just a minute, because it does have some very real implications for you and your bees, if it does turn out to be a warmer than average winter. So kind of what I'm seeing in the bees right now, you know, this, this is, these are some frames I took a picture, pictures of uh, recently, you know, I, you can see like the picture on the far, I think it's probably the far right side of your screen there, a little bit of brood, you know, every now and then in a hive, I'd find, you know, a couple of little patches about that size, but not much, you know, the two frames, the center frame there, and then most of that frame to the left is pretty much empty of brood. So, you know, don't panic if you don't see brood in your hive this time of year. You know, it's pretty common that those queens are rapidly or completely shut down. What I do like to see is what I'm seeing in these frames that came out of the brood nest. I'm seeing those beautiful bands of thick capped honey around the edge of those frames. I'm seeing some residual pollen, which is really nice because that means if they've got some residual stored pollen, they'll be able to use that to get started rearing brood in January or February when brood rearing really starts picking up, but before there's much natural pollen coming in. So I'd love to see some of those residual pollen stores still in the hive. And then of course, those thick bands of honey, that's great with the middle of the frame open because the bees will actually uh, cluster, um, stick their heads down in those cells and they'll cluster in those cells with bees all around them to help keep the hive warm. So, um, so I like to see a lot of honey on those frames, but still some openings in the middle uh, of those brood frames. So, um, so this is what I'm seeing. Again, depending on exactly where you are, you may be seeing no brood at all. You may be seeing a couple frames of brood still. Uh, if you're in some areas, you may sell have several frames of brood, but in general, for most folks, for most hives, brood rearing is completely finished or nearly there. So a couple uh, interesting things that I wanna kind of touch on, you know, there's not as much that we're doing in our bees right now, but there's a couple of things that occur in the winter that cause a lot of questions and uh, that are worth discussing briefly. One is are, are cleansing flights. So I, I get a lot of questions on this and I see it a lot in my bees and it's when, you know, the bees have been cooped up inside the hive for a week because it's too cold for them to fly. 
and then you get a nice warm sunny day even if it's you know 40 degrees and sunny without much of a wind bees will fly i mean i've seen bees fly in the 30s if it's calm and sunny so when you get those calm warm sunny days where the temperatures start getting up into the upper 30s or 40s especially once the temperatures get up into the 50s the bees kind of need to go to the bathroom they've been holding it that whole week and so you'll kind of see this explosion of bees coming out uh, in a bit of a hurry <laughs> out of the hive and they're all got to come out and go to the bathroom and so you'll see you know you'll see dozens and dozens of bees coming out of your hive flying around you maybe thinking what on earth are they doing what are they doing you know it's the middle of the winter they can't be foraging much well a lot of times they're going on the polite way to say it a cleansing flight they're going to the bathroom they've been holding it for a while and uh you know you might see these little uh yellow or orange speckles on your cars or uh, on your house as your bees come out and uh, use the bathroom. So I remember it was so funny uh, when I was really getting into beekeeping when I was a teenager, I, uh, I got to the point where I was probably, I don't know, 15 or 16. And I had about 50 hives uh, near my family's house. We lived out in the country, but uh, the, the bees, I kept them, you know, about 100, 200 feet from our house. And on warm winter days, you know, all, you know, those hives would just be flying like crazy, going cleansing flights. And it would cover my parents' cars with these little speckles of bee poop. And uh, my parents at the time, now they know, unfortunately, but they're like, what, where on earth are these speckles coming from? And they're so hard to scrub off the car. And I just feel like, well, I, don't, I don't have no idea. <laughs> so it took a few years till I eventually told them, because I knew if I told them, I would have to go clean the cars. Uh, but, uh, you know, so if you're seeing that, that's probably what's going on commercially, uh, these days, most of my, and I think I've mentioned this in previous webinars, uh, we keep our, our bees, most of our bees indoors and climate atmospherically controlled sheds in Idaho. And uh, a lot of, we do still keep some bees in Texas, but the majority of them, uh, for the winter, they spend it in these, uh, sheds indoors and they're in there for four months they're in there from october 1st to late january and in late january we pull them out and we send them to almonds by the way if you want to see i actually wrote a whole article about how indoor overwintering works and the this month's edition of the texas bee supply monthly so there's a whole article there's pictures so i won't get into describing what those sheds are like I, there's a whole article about it anyway all that to say when we bring those bees out and we bring them to california to pollinate almonds um, our Texas bees, uh, you know, are a different story, but, uh, those, those bees, um, they haven't gone to the bathroom in about four months. Now it doesn't hurt the bees, believe it or not, but, uh, you want to talk about some speckles on some cars when you've got, uh, thousands of hives coming out for the first time in four months. Um, we make a note of it to get the cars and the forklifts as far away from the bee yard as possible. Cause it's a bit of a mess. So probably way more detail than you wanted to hear on, uh, on uh, bee excrement tonight, but hey, we don't have as much to talk about tonight since it's December, so. Uh, okay, <laughs> so um, let's move on from that topic and talk a little bit about another common thing that we often see in the winter, and that's bees foraging on animal feed, on sawdust, and oftentimes bothering the neighbors. Uh, you, you see this a lot with uh, chicken food, you know, chicken scratch, the bees will uh, the bees will often forage on chicken feed or animal feed in the winter months. Now, there's two things they're going for. One, they're going for protein. And so what you'll often find is with sawdust, they're, they're actually gathering dust out of these grains or gathering dust out of sawdust as if it were pollen because there's no flowers blooming. And so they're looking for anything that even sort of resembles pollen or protein. Now, it really doesn't give them any nutrients, but they're trying anyway. The other thing you often see is them going for anything sweet, since there is, again, nothing whatsoever blooming. So on those warm days, sometimes I'll go after the uh, cattle feed that has molasses in it, horse feed that has molasses in it, and anything, anything remotely sweet. And honestly, I have, you know, even locally, you know, where in small bee yards, I have more problems with neighbors in the winter than I actually do in the spring or any other time of the year because 
you know, the bees are often foraging on people's chicken food or pet food in, in, the, in the winter and neighbors don't really appreciate that. So the, the only other time I have issues is in the dead of the summer when bees are drinking out of somebody's swimming pool. But we'll, we'll talk about that in, uh, in July. So this is a common occurrence. It doesn't really hurt the bees to, to gather that food. But again, it doesn't really provide them really any nat natural sustenance. I mean, there's no real nutrients in chicken food dust or sawdust. The biggest issue again is disturbing the neighbors. And so when, when I have this happen, there's a couple things I do. One, I the first thing I do is I do some open pollen feeding, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And that really gives the bees something else to forage on that actually is good for them rather than foraging on the neighbor's chicken, chicken food. The other thing I always tell people to do is one, if possible, you know, get that food somewhere that it's harder for the bees to get to. So put that feeder in the shade where it's cooler and the bees aren't gonna find it as easily. Move that feeder around if possible. If the bees are having to hunt for it every time, they're less likely to get on it. Feed, you know, maybe don't leave feed out all the time. Go out, feed, you know, let feed. And once the chickens are done or the horses or cows are done eating, gather up what's left or cover it so that the bees can't find it. You know, if, they're, if it's not there out present all the time, the bees, the bees are gonna usually lose interest. But the biggest thing that I like to do is open feed pollen substitute. So this is just when you would get pollen powder. So instead of getting a, a pollen patty, you would just get the powder before it's been mixed, which we sell. And you put that out on those warm sunny days in a pollen feeder and the bees just love it. I mean, they look like little white ghosts because <laughs> they, they literally land in the food, they roll themselves in it, and then they, they scrape the pollen substitute off of them and pack it onto their pollen on pollen baskets on their legs, just like they do natural pollen. And you can see this picture in the upper left with that blue feeder, that blue pollen feeder. The bees are just covered in that pollen substitute. And they, they will absolutely attack it on those warm winter days. So putting that out can really help. You can just put it out on the warm days or leave it out all the time. That blue feeder, we, we sell those. If you've got several hives, if you've got a bunch of hives, that's a really good feeder because it holds about, I think about 20 pounds of pollen powder at a time. And believe me, if you've got a dozen or two dozen hives, they can empty that feeder in a couple of days. It's amazing how much they can, can eat. If you've just got a few hives, I, I saw this on a Facebook page uh, recently and it was such a good idea. I had to mention it. The pro nook boxes so that's that yellow box you see in the lower left there you may have these if you bought nooks from us this year we sell all of our nooks in those special pro nook boxes so you may have one laying around if you don't they're not very expensive we sell them you can grab a pro nook box these are awesome open pollen feeding containers and what you do is you can just pop the lid off pour a couple pounds of that pollen powder in snap the lid back on in that little yellow vent you see on the front of that box, you can pull that vent completely off and it leaves a square hole, you know, about three to four inches in diameter open on the front of that box. So pull that opening, opening completely off and then the bees will just fly right in and out of that nook box foraging on that pollen substitute. The great thing is those nook boxes are designed to be weatherproof. So they stay, it stays dry. You can put it up in a tree or something. So not as many varmints can get to it because animals love pollen substitute. All animals love it. So getting it up off the ground or putting a little fence around it is helpful. But those just really make fantastic open pollen feeders. So um, trying to think any other notes on open pollen feeding. It, it's good for the bees. It's not critical that you feed open pollen substitute. You know, I really pushed hard on feeding the pollen patties, August, September, October, kind of wrapping up in November. Doing the open pollen feeding isn't as critical as feeding those pollen patties in the late summer and early fall. However, it is gonna benefit the bees. And what I like about it is one, it keeps them away from the neighbors, uh, but then it does give the bees something productive to do on those warm days. And then it, especially once we get into January, it'll encourage that queen to start laying a little bit earlier because bees, the queen will start laying naturally depending on where you are you know, anywhere from early January to you know, early to mid-February, depending on exactly where you are. 
But if, if they get that early intake of what they think is pollen, it can encourage them to start rearing brood a little earlier and a little faster than they normally would. So again, not critical, but it can be helpful to get the, get the brood rearing going a little bit sooner. So syrup feeding, not a lot to, not a whole lot to discuss here, um, just because we're not doing a whole lot of feeding at the moment. Hopefully you fed properly in the fall. And so your bees have plenty of stores going into winter. You know, for Texas, that's, you know, about 30 pounds of stores in the second box and ideally, you know, 10 to 20 pounds in the, the bottom box to get them through the winter. So your goal is really just to maintain about 30-ish pounds of honey in that second box in December. So you can go out there and you can kind of lift up on that, that top box on a warm day to see what the weight feels like. And it's just a guesstimate. And of course, January, it doesn't have to have 30 pounds. You know, we can kind of start, the bees are gonna be eating it and that's okay. We don't need 30 pounds in that second box in March. So, you know, in January, we're gonna talk about, okay, now they only need about 20 pounds up there. In February, okay, now they don't, now they only need about 10 pounds up there. But for December, I still like to try to maintain roughly 30 pounds up there. If I do need to feed, I feed two to one syrup rather than one to one syrup. So a thicker syrup is better because the bees can use it a lot faster instead of having to dilute water out of it like they have to do with one to one syrup. That two to one syrup, they can put it to use right away. And then I like to use division board feeders or top feeders, some form of internal feeder rather than a, uh, an entrance feeder because I don't, you know, when it's cold, the bees don't travel all the way to the entrance to get syrup. So I wanna make it as easy on them as I possibly can if they don't have enough food this time of year. If you've got 30 pounds in the second box-ish and then you've got, you know, two to four good frames of honey down in your bottom box, your bottom deep box, don't worry about feeding. Uh, just check them maybe once here in the next couple of weeks. Make sure that the weight still feels good, looks good. And then you probably don't have to feed till early spring. But if they don't have that, you do need to do some feeding. Which leads me to a couple reminders here. We did talk about this in our November webinar, which you can see on YouTube if you want to watch the November webinar recording. But uh, there's a couple quick things. If your hive does need food, or if they're especially if they're a weaker hive, so less than a deep box full of bees, or if they're really starving, maybe they have virtually no honey in their second box and maybe only a couple deep frames in their bottom box. So if they're really hungry, then it's helpful to give food to them directly on top of the cluster. And there's two ways you can do that. In November, we talked about doing the, the Ziploc bag feeding method, where as you can see in the picture, uh, you've got, Ziploc bags full of sugar water sitting directly on the top bars right above where the bees are clustered and you cut some little slits in the top of those Ziploc bags so that the bees can just crawl right up and at direct access to that syrup. Well one thing I didn't realize that uh, that we sold at Texas Bee Supply that I'm really I think is so cool because it's such a good idea. Um, I didn't notice we were uh, uh, Tuesday we had an ambitious plan. We decided that we were going to film a video for every product that we sold describing what it is and how to use it. And believe it or not, we actually did. <laughs> so we filmed so many videos and, and those are gonna go, we're, we're coming out with a new website in early January. And so when that new website goes live, you'll be able to go to any product that we sell and watch a video, uh, what it is, how to use it, tips on using, et cetera. So as we were doing all those videos, I got really acquainted with every product we sell. And we have this cool little, really, I think it's six or seven dollars. It's this little wood platform you see on the bottom left. And what you do with that, and I, I, I don't have a picture of it with the jars, but a Boardman feeder with a jar fits into each one of those holes. And so we actually have a quart glass jars that we sell. And then we also have two quart glass jars. So uh, two quarts that screw onto a Boardman style lid and you can insert one jar in each of those holes. And then that can sit directly on the top bars just like you see with those Ziploc bags. So pretend the Ziploc bags are not on that picture. You could set this little wooden platform directly on the top bars, put four jars of syrup right into, that, into those holes and the bees could forage on those jars 
of syrup right on top of the cluster. And what I like about that is unlike the Ziploc bags, it's not as messy. Sometimes those Ziploc bags leak and bees kind of make a mess of it. With that little jar holder, it can sit right on those top bars and the bees have direct access to syrup. So that was probably way more of an explanation than, than you were wanting for a, a really simple little device. But uh, I, when I saw that, I was like, I've got to mention that because if you've got a really hungry hive that's near starving or a really weak hive, that's a great way to put that syrup just kind of right on top of them. Now you do have to have an empty deep box to go around, as you see in the picture, to go around those feeders and then you, you put your lid on top of it. And this, this little feeder works other times of the year too. If, I, if, I were, if you're using it in the springtime or summertime or even the fall really, you wouldn't want to put it directly on top of the top bars. You'd want to put your inner cover in place. And then this little wood box sits right on top of your inner cover. And the bees will go through the hole in your inner cover to access that syrup. If you were to leave it during the spring and summer, right on top of those exposed top bars, the bees would fill that empty box with comb. And you don't want that to happen. So that inner cover during the spring and summer is kind of a barrier. They won't go through it and build comb, but they can still access it through the hole in the inner cover. So hopefully that makes sense. Just a little, little tip there. Okay, let's talk. We talked about this a little bit in November. I want to I wanna come back with a couple of additional points on this because fondant, feeding bees, sugar cakes, fondant, et cetera, basically a brick of sugar has suddenly become really popular. I'm not sure why. Uh, it, it's something that was really popular in the past and it seems to be getting a bit of a resurgence in popularity. And, and so I, I want to I talk about a couple of things to be aware of if you're feeding fondant or sugar patties. Um, and that is that there, there are some things you, you need to be careful of. A common way to create this fondant is to basically get sugar. There's all different recipes, but you get a bunch of sugar um, and you, you essentially heat it up. You bake it into kind of these sh sugar bricks that you can then put into the hive. So there's a, there's a risk there. And that is when you heat sugar, especially to high temperatures, something called HMF forms inside of sugar. It, it happens in honey, corn syrup, sugar syrup, any sugar that you heat to high temperatures above about 180 degrees, I believe, HMF forms. HMF is deadly to bees. Now, doesn't mean if you put a fondant brick in your hive that's been heated, all your bees are gonna die. Estimates I've seen is that it, it can kill, you know, five to 10% of bees. Overall, it definitely weakens the bees in general because that HMF is kind of like poison for them. So my recommendation is don't ever feed fondant or a sugar cake that has been heated. Now, I think there are some ways to create a sugar brick without heat. And, and so that would be an acceptable way, acceptable way to do it. But don't ever heat up sugar, especially baking it, because it will create that HMF and it can harm bees. So I would avoid that. The other concern I have, and, and I'm not totally opposed to feeding an unheated sugar brick, it, despite what it probably sounds like, the other concern to be aware of is that it takes a lot of effort for the bees to turn that granular sugar into a liquid, which is what they have to do before they're able to use it. So, you know, they've got to take that sugar, add water to it, turn it into essentially a syrup before they can really eat it or store it. And so for that reason, I'm not a big fan of these just because it's a lot of effort for the bees to turn it into that liquid and especially if I have a hive that's really hungry, they need food and they need it fast. And feeding them something that's gonna take a lot of time for them to actually be able to use, not a big fan of. So now that being said, an unheated sugar brick, not gonna hurt the bees. You know, if, if they need food fast, I will go with a liquid syrup. If they aren't in urgent need of food, it's definitely not gonna hurt the bees as long as it's not heated. So feel free to do it. Um, it's just gonna be a little more effort for the bees. One of the biggest concerns that I often see when it comes to feeding sugar syrup or any form of syrup in a hive during the winter is building up moisture in the hive. A lot of people say, well, if you, if you feed a liquid syrup in the hive in the winter, then the excess moisture evaporating out of that container of sugar water in the hive 
is going to build excess moisture in the hive and you, you don't want you know, droplets of water raining onto your clusters of bees from the inside of the lid. Because remember the bees are generating heat and it's cold outside and then you put a bunch of liquid in the hive. The concern is it's gonna generate all this excess moisture which can hurt the bees. So it, it can happen but I've rarely seen it happen, especially when you're using a two to one sugar syrup because a two to one sugar syrup is very thick. There's not a whole bunch of moisture that is evaporating out of it. So when you use a two to one sugar syrup in a hive, I don't usually see a condensation issue. What you can do is you can slightly crack the, your, your lid, you know, maybe a, a less than a fourth of an inch. An upper ventilation is a good way for that excess moisture to vent out of the hive. And if the bees don't like it, they'll just seal it up with propolis. So that's a, a way to prevent moisture. It's not something that is a huge, huge deal in the South as much because we just don't have those incredibly cold winters. And then in, you know, we don't have as much of a temperature contrast inside and outside the hive as you do if it's say negative 20 degrees. So it's not as much of an issue uh, in, in the South, especially. So if you're concerned about moisture in the hive or if you see moisture in the hive, again, you can provide that slight upper entrance and that usually takes care of it pretty fast. Feeding pollen substitute in the hive, not really necessary in December. If you want to, you can, it's certainly not gonna hurt the bees but it's not necessary or nearly as critical as it was in the fall months. So again, you, again, if you've got some extra patties, you wanna put them in the hive, definitely not gonna hurt anything, not gonna be as much of a help as it was earlier in the year either. As far as combining hives, we, we kind of talked about this in depth in November. I, you can do it in December. I would wait for a warm day because when it's, 40 degrees or 30 degrees during the day and you open up a hive, it's gonna look like a really small little weak hive because those bees are gonna be clustered so incredibly tightly to stay warm. And you're really not able to get a good judge of what the strength of the hive really is. If it's 65 degrees and sunny or 70 and the bees are flying, well then you can, but there's not many days like that in December. So I, I tend to try to get all my combining done of weaker hives by November and kind of just leave them alone in December and you know in general wait till late January to see if a hive needs to be combined. So I don't recommend doing a lot of combining in December, just kind of let them be and, and wait it out till January and see what the strength looks like. So this is just a picture of a hive, you know, if it's a really cold day, this hive may look like it's only four frames of bees, but I've seen hives that look like that at 40 degrees be eight frames covered with bees uh, on a 70 degree day. So it's just tough when it's really cold to get a great gauge of what the actual population is in detail enough to justify combining. So for that reason, hold off on combining in general until we get to next year. One other, I think this is one of my last slides before we get it over to packaging and liquefying honey and all that uh, with the elums. But I wanna talk about picking up dead hives. You know, we, this is a time when a lot of hives, we typically see them die. And it's not that something is killing them at the moment so much as we're kind of seeing something that damaged the bees earlier in the year is kind of finally coming to fruition and the bees finally died. And kind of when it, when it starts getting really cold like this is when we often see hives start to die. Usually it's caused by something that happened a couple months ago, but they, the cold weather was kind of the final straw. So oftentimes varroa mites are a cul and the viruses that they transmit are the culprits of winter deaths. And you can have a hive that looks really strong over the fall, good bee population, don't see anything wrong with it. And then suddenly they seem to collapse and die when it starts getting cold. Oftentimes that was because varroa mites got too high and killed them or the viruses got, or the varroa mite populations got out of control, which I'm going to say anything more than seven mites per hundred bees is out of control to the point where the virus has probably got to pandemic level and the bees struggled and eventually were killed by those viruses going into the winter. That the viruses can linger, the viruses that varroa mites transmit 
can linger six months and damage the hive six months, even after varroa mite populations have come under control. So if you treated for varroa mites and you, you don't have you know, more than two varroa mites per hundred bees in your hive, uh, and yet your hive still collapsed in the winter and they weren't queenless and they had plenty of food, then I would say my, the first thing I usually ask is how high did your varroa mite levels get over the summer months or fall? You know, if they got over seven mites per hundred bees, I often blame that winter collapse on viruses. Now, if you didn't treat for varroa mites and your hive died, probably was varroa mites that killed them. Uh, or if you haven't tested, you know, if you didn't, if you haven't tested since midsummer for varroa mites, you know, there's those varroa mite levels could have spiked again in the late fall and been the culprit of a killed hive. So if your hive had has plenty of food, wasn't queenless, still kind of dwindled down and died, I often blame that on varroa mites or viruses. There are some other causes, you know, nosema is one, but it's pretty uncommon. Uh, could have just been a failing queen and the hive couldn't get up to the strength they needed going into winter. Could be they had poor nutrition going into winter. A lot of different causes. You can jump back to our November webinar and James and Sherry did a great job of kind of talking over all the different reasons that hives can die uh, and diagnosing that death. But if you do have those dead hives, be sure to pick them up pretty quickly because mice love dead beehives. That is their favorite place to spend the winter. In fact, it's their favorite, a, a live hive. They also love even more spending the winter in a live hive because uh, it's warm. And so <laughs> you often will have mice move into a hive and they'll kind of just build a little nest over in the corner of a hive and they chew up the frames and make a mess. And, and so they spread, they'll, they'll move into live hives or dead hives, but make sure you get those dead hives picked up out of the bee yard properly stored. If you want to prevent mice from getting in the hive, you can buy a mouse guard. We sell a really cool little metal one. It's basically a metal strip and it's got a bunch of holes in it that, uh, that the mice can't fit through, but bees can fit through. So if you want to prevent mice from getting in, that's a helpful little tool. The honey and pollen from that dead hive, you can use it for next year for starting with a new hive. It's a great way to, you, know, you can pour a package into it or get a nook and put a nook into that equipment. And, you know, it's so discouraging to lose bees. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now coming up on it. And I still get so discouraged during the winter time as you're pulling those dead hives out of a bee yard. But it's very normal. I mean, the average annual loss rate for beekeepers across the board is 44% of hives die every year. So it's not abnormal to lose bees. It's very normal to lose bees. And that's, you know, why I encourage all beekeepers to learn how to split. You know, we do a lot of courses in the spring of how to make splits so that you can take the hives that survived, make more hives and recoup your losses. And that's the only way to keep going in beekeeping. And, uh, and so I know it's discouraging, but that comb is so valuable to start your new hive. And so to be able to pick up that dead out, store it, if, if it has honey in it, still has pollen in it, that's fine. You, you know, store it with those wax moth crystals uh, once so that it's protected for next year. And that is a phenomenal, phenomenal start for a new hive next year, whether it's a split or a nook or a package. If you're new to beekeeping, and this was your first year, you'll be amazed how much faster bees can grow next year with that equipment and that comb that's already ready to go. So you, it wasn't a loss. That drawn out equipment with those drawn out frames is a fantastic start for next year. And, and you'll be able to probably be an even more successful beekeeper next year with that equipment ready to roll. So, oh, I lied. I, I thought that was the last slide. Um, what to expect as you're going through your bees in December this is kind of what I expect to see in most hives in December. Minimal brood, we kind of already talked about that. If more than one frame of brood is present, if you're in a, you know, maybe Southeast Texas or an area that's staying a bit warmer and you've still got, you know, full frame or two or three of brood, consider giving them a pollen patty or two to kind of keep that brood rearing going as long as possible to keep that hive as strong as possible. Most hives are kind of shutting down in brood, but if, you, if you're the lucky beekeeper, that still has some frames of brood, then uh, you know, go ahead and give them, give them a pollen patty or two, give them some syrup and keep that brood rearing going as long as possible to keep that hive population uh, growing. 
hopefully you'll see some pollen stores. You're probably not going to see a frame of pollen in there, but you, you hopefully will see some pollen stored in the hive. Hope you, you should see more than four deep frames covered with bees. That's kind of the minimum population that we want to see. So as you're going through a hive on a warm day in December, you should see at least four deep frames covered in bees, ideally more, more the merrier. And then at least 30 pounds of stored honey in the second box. So that's kind of what you should see as you're going through your hive. Don't panic if you don't see brood, perfectly, perfectly normal to not see brood this time of year. Okay, this is my last slide, slide I believe. When to look at bees, I did go over this in, in some depth in, in the November webinar. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on it, but this kind of outlines when you can look at your bees. If you're looking for less than one minute, so if you're just kind of breaking the boxes apart to get a quick glance of population, if you're just lifting up on the box, you know, not really pulling out frames, then anything above about 32 degrees is fine. If you're doing more than a minute, pulling out maybe one frame, taking a quick look, then, you know, above four, sunny and above 40 degrees. If you're pulling out several frames, kind of doing a more thorough inspection, make sure it's sunny and above 50 degrees. Ideally do any inspection in the heat of the day, several hours before dark to allow the bees time to recluster and regroup after you've disturbed them before it gets cold. Keep in mind, it's always better to check your bees than not. They can, they can e even below 32 degrees. I'll admit I've cracked boxes open at, I'm trying to remember the coldest, but you know, I've cracked bees open in, in the teens in the temperature, just really quick crack open, looked at the population, closed them again and it's not gonna hurt them. Just make it quick and, and it's not gonna hurt them. It's worse to let them starve to death. <laughs> so uh, check them, don't be, you know, don't be pulling frames out when it's freezing cold, but, but make sure they've got plenty of food. The check is very important, way more than, uh, you know, worrying about the cold. So, okay. So with that, uh, James and Sherry are going to come on and they're gonna talk about liquefying honey and bottling honey for the winter months. And then I'm gonna jump over and I'm gonna start answering the questions as they roll in. And then I'll jump back on at the end and gear you guys up for what we're gonna be doing in January. January is kind of the unofficial official start to the bee season. I know it's January and it's still cold, but the queen starts laying. And so January is gonna be a really big month and uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So James and Sherry, you guys can take it away. Okay, well, you're really gonna kind of get James. We're gonna, we're gonna play um, take turnsies tonight. So <laughs> James is gonna start. This is James Elam. Blake, thank you. We, uh, we enjoyed your, your program immensely. It was really cool. I like the part about um, Queens getting started in January. January is my favorite month of the year in beekeeping. <laughs> so is February, March, <laughs> April, May, June, July. This month, Sherry and I are gonna talk about honey. And my portion of this is going to be liquefying honey. Um, one of the reasons that honey is so special to, to not only ourselves, but to other consumers out in the marketplace is that most people realize that, that uh, individual beekeepers honey is pure. It's unfiltered, it's unadulterated, and it's, it's not overly heated. Uh, that's one of the things that makes it special. Uh, if we take that to the step to the next level, uh, and we think about maybe a customer that we might have had that says, this honey doesn't taste like it did last time. What's different? Well, if it's not the time of year where our, where our nectar was different, then what happened? Is it possible that we change the taste of our honey by overheating it? Is that a possibility? Did we do something to alter its color, uh, its taste, its aroma? So those are things I want to talk about tonight. Um, so keeping our honey special is really a pretty cool thing. Um, the National Honey Board promotes what they deem as, as a practice of um, trustworthy and pure honey. Uh, we can take that to our level and say that we should be doing the same thing. So our steps should include what, what we can call best practices, not the only way to liquefy honey because there's lots of ways, but we're going to shoot right down the middle with, with the concept of this program. Um, Considering that over time, most all honey is going to crystallize at some point. Uh, there, there are certainly some crops of honey that are, that are more prone to it than others. Uh, but our focus is going to be on how to, how to decrystallize granulated honey or to, uh, 
uh, kind of get it back to that flowing texture that we're looking for. Um, and again, the word responsibly doing that is going to be the key, utilizing best practices. Those best practices we'll talk about a little bit more, but it's kind of interesting when you look at that slide. Um, if we look at our customers, if we look at customers in grocery stores, uh, overall, there's a, there's a vision that, that crystallized honey is bad and that some even think that you need to throw it out. Well, we know differently, but there's also that opposite vision that the honey that is clear and pretty and you, 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 know, you can see through it and it's just, it just pours so easily that that has to be what honey really is all about. Uh, little do they know what they don't know and that we know the possibilities of, of national labeled honey in big box stores carry the opportunity for, for difficult um, sources of honey and things that we don't really want. So we, uh, while we have the dilemma where maybe our, our clientele or our base uh, have a vision of what real good honey is versus what we want it to be, uh, it's our opportunity to kind of help them out and show them what our goals really are. Uh, when it comes to, to um, liquefying honey, the, uh, the, the concept should come up, just like the slide says, what happens? Uh, I like to look at this as, as if we make sugar water up for our bees to feed them sugar syrup to feed our bees, and we look at the percentages that are shown below where it says honey is 70% sugars and 20% water. Well, back to what I was saying, think about trying to mix up sugar syrup where you had a seven to two ratio, 70% sugar to 20% water. I think you'd find it, we'd all find it very difficult, if not impossible, for that honey to suspend. So you can see how difficult it is for sugar not to try to fall out of the sugar water. Uh, it's, just, it's just kind of one of those things. The 70-20 rule just kind of says that unless there's something there for the pollen, for the uh, honey to collect on, uh, like pollen or, or waxes or things that are in it, that uh, we're likely to have a uh, granulation difficulty at some point in time. Uh, when we think about crystallized honey and its reputation of being bad, um, we can easily overcome that by the method in which we heat our honey. We all know that honey can be liquefied using heat and there's many ways to do it. Uh, I like to look at the, the idea of, of matching the temperature of the beehive uh, as where we should start with the heat that we're utilizing to, me to melt our honey. I'll use the word melt. If we think that a beehive brood nest is typically around 95, and then during the heat of summer, it might even go up to 104, but does it naturally go up to temperatures higher than that within the colony? Uh, not normally. So if we can liquefy honey utilizing that basic temperature range of 95 to 104, that becomes the best practice that we wanna consider. Look at some methods of, of uh, heating honey. Uh, if we can heat honey slowly by use of, look at the heat cabinet that's shown there. Uh, we have some friends, Roy and Karen Morris, that have a freezer. And the picture on the left just shows the box freezer. On the right-hand side, it shows an extension cord just going through the hinge section with a clamp lamp utilizing a 40 to 40 watt bulb. They leave that on all the time that they have honey in there. It keeps the honey uh, at, a, at a constant temperature. They can check that temperature as they need to in regards to how much honey is in there. Temperature checks are very important in where we're going. So that, that's their concept of how to do it. Another way, and this is one I've never even thought of, uh, more friends, Malcolm and Nita Sapp, they utilize a very simplistic method of heating plastic jars. Uh, you can see if, if you kind of envision it, there's a heating pad underneath that. So they have the jar sitting on top of it and they put a cloth or a towel over the top of the jars themselves. And it makes for an, a perfect method of slow heating, which is ideally what we want to do to liquefy our honey. If we try to do it rapidly, we're going to find ourselves with the possibility of changing that flavor, that aroma, that color. Here's a couple of other methods. Water baths are heavily utilized. Lots of people do this. Um, matter of fact, I've got a little article I'm going to read some excerpts from in a few minutes, but a uh, water bath, if you'll heat the water, and then immerse the jar within it. Uh, just keep refilling the water as the temperature declines and uh, you'll eventually get to where you're going. Again, another very safe, effective way. 
as long as the water's not too hot. Overly hot water can scald or burn the honey that's on the outside edge of the, of the jar. Um, water boils at 212. If you put boiling water in there, you can envision what's gonna to happen to that honey that it comes in contact with. Bucket heaters are a lot of fun for people that have a, a lot of honey. Five gallon buckets are really fun to keep up with. If you just set a five gallon bucket down in your house or in your barn, uh, you can be certain crystallization is, is likely to occur. Um, occasional use of a bucket heater is a great way to do it. It's a fairly rapid heater uh, and that happens fairly quickly. Um, we do sell these heaters but uh, monitor it. It's got a temperature setting on it. And it's a great way to do larger volumes. This one um, is not labeled uh, according to the picture. Uh, it shows a microwave oven, but it's not called slide, whatever it is, microwave oven. It's called avoid overheating. Yeah. Um, microwave ovens, while they do a very efficient, quick job of uh, liquefying honey, offer lots of opportunities for difficulties and that one, we cannot monitor the temperature. Um, that can get away from us very quickly. Do you do it for 30 seconds? Do you do it on high? Do you do it on low? Well, the actual question or the actual answer should be somewhere around 30 seconds at a time and on defrost. And then according to the size of the container that you're warming up, uh, you'll be able to judge how much longer you should heat it. The, uh, the difficulties with, with Microwave ovens are one uh, plastic will have a great tendency to warp. Um, if you go, if you've got plastic containers, uh, the the best method to approach that, uh, other than just cooking it really, really, really slow, is to transfer that honey into a jar and then warm within the jar. But microwave ovens are probably the least effective, not least effective, the least encouraged way to to warm your honey and that you talk about something that will change the taste of your honey if you overheat it. A microwave oven will do that. And it'll melt the plastic jar. It can warp the plastic jar. Don't boil raw honey. I think we just kind of <laughs> talked about that. Right. And that if water boils at 212 degrees and you drop a jar in there at 212 degrees, uh, what's gonna to happen to that honey? Don't overheat honey in plastic bottles. I have some temperature ranges that uh, was pretty interesting for honey. Let's see if I can spot it here. Well, let's see. That's pretty interesting. I really want to give it to you. At any rate, uh, I, don't, I don't see it. It's just got mixed up and all that stuff. Oh, that. Now I don't really see it, but that really doesn't matter. Uh, the, uh, the, the not overheating in plastic is really important. While I don't think a lot of people pay a lot of attention to it, it's possible that if you've got honey down into a, a uh, plastic jar and the temperature of that bottle gets too hot, there's certainly a possibility that some of that, that uh, plastic off gases could impart itself into the honey. So that's something to really be careful of. All right, you good? That pretty much gets the most of it. I did tell them that I was gonna gently read something in just a second. Okay. Uh, this is from a, um, an epidemiologist for foodborne diseases. And I'm just kind of gonna kind of just summarize it overall, but it talks about plastic contaminating honey and is it possible or not? And uh, he goes into a, a dissertation about the melting point of polyethylene being less than the saturation point of sugar and, and kind of on and on and on and don't worry about it and do whatever you want to. And he says to uh, uh, heat your water to 195 degrees. Hey and put the jar in there and leave it overnight. And tomorrow you'll have perfect, perfectly liquefied honey. Well, this is the kind of thing that you can find when you go reading on the internet. Remember that best practices are working within the range of a colony, that 95 to 104, even up to the 120 degree point is acceptable if you do it quickly and don't let it sit there. But best practices are key to liquefying honey. That's right. Good, good job, good job. All right, so now y'all gonna get me. You're gonna get, you're gonna get me. Now I gotta figure out to go to the next program. I'm going to click that. See everybody laugh with me as it takes me a minute to click over to mine. Okay, everybody ready for my section? All right, this is the fun part. I actually love this, this topic. When uh, Blake gave us the options of different uh, topics, I was like, I want this one. 
I, I want this one. I, I, I prefer to do the, uh, the, handling, the, the bottling and the, and the selling honey because marketing is my, that, I love it. I just, I just love marketing. So let's get started. All right, bottling and selling honey. So it really doesn't matter what stage you are. If you're going to be one that's going to give it away or you're going to be uh, going to a farmer's market or selling a grocery store, which is obviously a much low, uh, higher level, you're going to need to decide in advance where you are in that game. So the, the reason you will is because look at these three pictures. Which one am I? Are you going to be the one on the left? That's Blake's facility where he's extracting 500,000 pounds of honey a year, or are you gonna be the one on the right that that's James, James and Sherry's kitchen, where we're gonna extract 500 to 800 pounds a year. I, I'm thinking that one's more my speed, but you'll need to decide where you are in the game before you get started because a lot of things come into play when we want to do, because we want to do things right. We want to make sure that we are following the rules, getting our labeling right, getting any licensing, so forth and so on. Segue to this slide. Regardless of the size of your operation, there are certain rules and regulations that apply. And before anybody goes, oh no, I don't want to talk about rules and regulations, I assure you I'm not going into detail because it is lengthy. We could be here for days talking about it and still, still not cover everything. So I'm just going to give you some highlights. There's five areas of jurisdiction. And I'm going to encourage you when you've decided where you're going to be. Are you going to be in the commercial end of it? Or are you going to be the at home or somewhere in the middle where you're going to be selling at different locations? You're going to want to contact the Texas Department of State Health Services and tell them. These folks actually are very good at answering questions, but that's where your food manufacturer's license is obtained. But if you've got a question of whether or not you need to have a food manufacturer's license, don't hesitate to contact them. I've spoken with them many times with different questions that uh, beekeepers we know have. They were quick to answer and it all went fine. It, went, it was just fine. Uh, FDA food facility registration, that's at fda.gov. If you're going to wholesale your honey, in other words, sell it in buckets and engage in interstate commerce, and that's just a fancy way of saying you're trucking your honey, um, then you'll need to get with the get a food facility registration through the FDA. Moving on to another FDA, we all fall under the FDA food labeling. We want to go in and check this out. It's not, it's, it's lengthy reading, but it, uh, you'll be able to spot what pertains to you. Um, it's basically it's just gonna tell you what needs to be on your label. And like I said, pertains to everybody from commercial down to hobby beekeepers. Um, it's gonna tell you about, um, you need to have a statement of identity. In other words, what's in the bottle? Well, it's honey, of course. So it'll tell you how big that's gotta be and what uh, addressing. It'll tell you that you need to put the weight of your honey on there in two different forms in standard and in, in metric or like grams. Um, but it lists that out in there. It's not complicated, don't overcomplicate it, but that's another thing that you'll want to look into. Um, and then the last two are easy. I, I think this is easy. Local health department guidelines, that's only if you uh, have a question about expanding beyond selling it to uh, your family, or um, if you want to start getting retail, going retail, then you might need to get a food manufacturer's license or get your facility inspected by uh, the state, the local health department. And if that's the case, again, kind of like the uh, TDSH, um, they, they're really open to answer your questions. The local health department, when I've, I've sent folks over there that had questions, they were quick to answer them. So uh, don't be afraid of of asking them if you really need to, because they're, they're not out to stop you from going into business. They want to help you to do what you need to do. Lastly, homeowners association and deed restrictions. And I put it applicable because um, I, I'm surprised to hear that there are subdivisions that don't even want you having uh, somebody come up and buy a jar of honey. Um, most do not, but you might take a peek if you do have an HOA, if there is a 
restriction of selling honey or selling, I don't know, I mean just honey, but selling something out of your house. Um, it might have a business, you know, say so you can't have a business. And if that's the case, you might want to check with somebody. You don't want to get in trouble over something just like selling honey. Um, this to me should be a no brainer. We all need to follow the good manufacturing pra practices. And I can tell you, there's a lot to read here. If you want to screenshot this or take a picture with your phone, that little, uh, that long 25 TAC, strange little symbol, strange little symbol, and all those numbers does take you to the correct page, but there's each of these things that you can open up. And I believe it or not, I have read most of that and it's not fun reading. Let me just overview it for you in four simple bullet points. Clean environment, avoid cross-contamination, clean utensils, and overall clean bottling conditions across the board. I don't think this is hard. I think that what it, we should get out of this is that we are, what's expected from something that we sell is what we expect in something we buy. I want to know that when I purchase something off of a shelf or from someone that they have taken measures to make sure it's clean and it's safe for me to consume. No different from, no different from what uh, you would expect any, anywhere else. All right, now we get to choose our bottle. I tell you, James and I spent some time with this and we've actually changed bottles over the years. Some, sometimes because we had to, sometimes because we wanted to know your market or think about your market. If you're going to be selling at a boutique in, um, in a wonderful little shop in Georgetown, um, you're, maybe a mason jar is not your, your bottle that you should choose. Maybe it's that mooth jar, that top left-hand picture there, or maybe the, the little skept that might have a pretty little colorful lid with a piece of a cloth on tied with a nice little bow on the side of it. Or if you're gonna be farmer's market, or if you're gonna be just handing it to people uh, on a roadside, roadside vendor, maybe that mason jar is good, or that one pound squeeze jar. Um, the bear you see on the far right, probably the most common for small scale beekeepers and also even large scale beekeepers. I know that a 12 ounce bear um, is one of Blake's biggest sell selling items. I, um, I think it's amazing. There's thousands of those little bears that go out. Um, <laughs> we typically sell in jars because our market wants jars. So if you're more small town, then, then think about that in what your jar choice is. And then when you think about your jar, think about your label. If you've created your label prior to your jar, you're, you don't want your label to not fit your jar. If you've got a big square label, it's not gonna fit on that cute little skep jar, is it? So think about these things prior to investing a lot of time and money into it. The perfect label, this is right up my alley. We have only developed two labels that were marketable labels in our entire honey production time. And they've, they've only varied by the background. Mostly it has stayed the same, but taking a minute, really and truly, it doesn't take all that long, develop a good logo for your, you, your farm that's unique to you and your farm. Something that says me, that makes you different than the other person that's at that farmer's market or the other person that's the honey uh, producer down the road. Something that's, that just screams you or says what y'all are about. Um, also on that label, promote what unique forage flavors, if it's clover honey or it's tallow honey or cotton honey, something that makes you stand out. That's gonna make a, a, an impression on somebody seeing your label. Use terms that garner attention. Local. Now, local is used, I will say, we, every time we go to the grocery store, James, and he can attest to this, he gets in front of the honey jars and he just looks at it like it's going to change every time we go. And local is that catchphrase, right? I'm down to catchphrase. It is, and, I, and it's not always honest because local can be, if we have a, if we're in Conroe and we see a jar that says local, but the, the honey producer is in Austin, is that local to us? It really isn't. But terms that garner attention could be other things like um, taste great or uh, best in town. That kind of falls under catchphrase as well. Our catchphrase is our bees producing, making your honey. Our bees making your honey. We like that so well, we've trademarked that. And it's been on our label ever since we created a label. It works. Phone number. And I will tell you, phone number is not required by the FDA on your label. 
especially as a small scale beekeeper. But the very first time that we had somebody with an empty jar knock on our door and go, I need more honey, I would have called, except that I didn't have your phone number. All I had was your address that was on the label. I thought, well, gosh, this is a no brainer. Why don't we put the phone number so somebody can just call or text and say, can I have some more honey? So put that phone number on there. If you've got a phone number that, you know, maybe if you work all day, you can't, but do, do put a way your folks can reach you and reach you quickly because you want to sell more honey. All right, now we're ready to bottle honey. We're ready. This is a picture, matter of fact, it's a picture right in here where we're sitting. I'd show you, but it looked just like that. It's right over there. That's our um, heated honey tank. And so we're gonna talk about that in a second, but I wanted you to see what we actually fill our bottles in every day. So now you're ready to bottle. You have choices. Um, and I will say we've migrated to every, we've done all these things except the one on the bottom there. <laughs> That's Blake's operation. Pour from a pitcher into a bottle, my first bullet point. And I chuckle when I say that because James and I did this for years. We literally would store our honey in five gallon buckets, which we still do, but we would take it and get a, a measuring cup. I have a big measuring cup. I get the measuring cup, pour it into a pitcher and then the pitcher into the bottles. We did this for years, worked beautifully, did not have a big investment of a heated tank. And James's presentation on uh, crystallization, we did all of the above. It, it, we just would melt it down when we had to, warm it slightly, if it would start to crystallize on the bottom of those buckets. But it worked very, very well. And it was a no cost, basically no cost uh, way to fill uh, honey bottles. That white picture, pitcher is a, a honey bucket with a filler gate. Works great. Um, we use that for, for a while as well. The gates um, work very well. You just open it up, fill your bottle, close it back up, and you're good for the go. Um, warming tank with filler valve. That's that top right hand picture that's similar to the one that we have here in, in my office. It works wonderful because it has an automatic warmer like James was talking about. Uh, keeping that temperature of the hive. It keeps it around, I think it's the top, top heat is 110 in that, in that heater and that's wonderful. So every few days we'll just turn that, plug it in. It warms it up just to a nice little toasty temperature. Doesn't degrade the honey at all. We still have good tasting honey, doesn't darken it, doesn't do anything because we sell quite a bit. Um, works great, plus it's got a great filler valve on it. Um, then, of course, you've got that, that large scale. You're down there. If you have aspirations of being a big honey producer, this is a nice machine. And I got to believe Blake's probably got more than one of these. Um, but this is one of those that's going to bottle it, it's going to label it, and put it into a box for you. Um, I can say I'm happy for Blake to do that. We're good to be on our level. Uh, we're totally happy to be on our level. Um, steps to filling a pretty jar of honey. I probably learned this by being in honey contests that, you know, we are judged on how pretty our bottle of honey is, aren't we? Because um, other beekeepers will go, look, see how pretty my honey is? See how pretty my honey is? It's in the bottling. Um, put the label on prior to filling. And you're probably wondering why I did that as a first bullet point, because a pretty jar of honey hasn't been one that's laid over and had any time for that honey to create a little bit of a foam line somewhere other than at the very tippy top. So lay your bottles down, put your label on, all your labels, this is our labels that we use, and make sure they're done before you fill it. Then fill clean bottles to the collar if possible. So what I'm referring to is the collar is that little ridge around the bottom of that yellow lid right there. If anyone has canned out there, you know that terminology, fill to the collar. It appears better, it looks better to be to that collar where there's not any airspace line. But you notice I put if possible. One problem we have run into with this bottle particular, because this is uh, new to us, this one you're seeing in this picture, because no longer can you get quart mason jars since COVID. It's been difficult to get smooth quart mason jars because um, you can't put a label on one with embossing. 
is that this bottle is supposed to be a quart, but a quart actually measures about an inch and a half. Is that right? About an inch and a half down um, from the top. So it's not as pretty, not filled all the way to the top. We absolutely, or we took the liberty when we had these labels made to leave that open where we could change the quantity on there. So if we do go all the way up to the top, we can adjust that quantity on the labeling. But if you already have it printed, just think that through, think that through. Um, oh, and I wanted to say something about clean bottles. You see the small lid on this or a small neck on this bottle. We are assuming these bottles are coming clean. Ours come um, wrapped. We know mason jars uh, come clean. We've always felt like they do, but we always wash them and sterilize them first, right? These bottles, that's next to impossible. We're trusting that they are cleaned. Um, take it from me, don't put this bottle in the dishwasher. You're gonna end up with water spots in there that you'll never, ever, ever, ever get out. You can fill it with honey, you're still gonna see those water spots. So we're gonna assume that they're clean. We just, we just gonna assume that. Avoid filling with warm honey. You're probably wondering why, why did you say that when you've got a warming tank? We typically don't fill with the warm honey. We'll warm that tank, let it warm for 24 hours, then cut it off and then fill our uh, bottles a little later on. Warm honey has a tendency to leave more of a foam line and that foam line's not very attractive. So think that through. Hot honey, especially when I say hot, that extremist, extreme temperature really will leave um, a foam line. And that's not pretty. Your customers, they want it to be consistent and cooler honey feels smoother. So just, just FYI. So how to cal calculate quantity. This is pretty easy. This is elementary math. If your empty, empty container weighs two ounces and it's filled, it weighs 18 ounces, then no brainer, your net weight is 16 ounces. And you see there, I've got it translated also into grams. So this is common. This is your one pound bottle, 16 ounces, 454 grams. I've had that memorized for years. But just do that in any jar you've got. If it's a glass jar, it's obviously gonna weigh more. So weigh it before you fill it and then weigh it after you fill it. Do the simple math. That's what your label needs to be. That's one reason why I said, Get your label and your jar, get that figured out first. Don't get all these labels made with 16 ounces, 454 grams, and you end up with an 18 ounce or a 14 or a 12 ounce jar. You know, things, things do change. Uh, warning statement. We get asked this question a lot. If, do I need to, am I required to put the do not feed honey to infants under one year of age? It's advisable according to the FDA, but it is not required. Um, it is a voluntary label. So you don't have to, you can have it printed on your label if you want, that's fine as well. Uh, the nutrition label is only required if you exceed $50,000 in food sales. Um, that is uh, part of the getting larger aspect. And good to note to know is that you can buy those nutrition labels already printed up and all you have to do is just uh, stick them on the back of your bottle because honey is, is, a, is a basic food and you can get pre-printed nutrition labels that work great, work great for you. All right, some helpful hints. And that freezer isn't the freezer that Roy and Karen Morse use, but it's very similar. Um, I, I wanted to put that in there because I, I really think that everybody needs to have something. We have a frame freezer for our, our uh, comb to be protected. I really think that this is a great idea. James and I are talking about seriously doing this for our bottled honey. Um, that way we can bottle more in advance. Um, but it's a good, good idea what he showed and what James talked about. Don't store in plastic honey buckets with gates. I put that first because remember the picture with the white bucket and the orange gate? As great a tool as that is, it does not store honey well. You've got a round bucket and a flat gate. It doesn't matter how good you install that, it's going to leak eventually. It's not a lot, a big leakage, but it will leak. You can put something under there. If you just have to store it in that, you can put something under there and it'll just kind of drip out, but that's really not your long-term storage. Just store in white bucket or your plastic buckets and leave it there and then transfer it into the one with the gates. Um, store in the honey above 85 degrees. 
high temperature. I love that. But to me, that was like a light bulb went off. Uh, only bottle what you can sell soon. We made this mistake, learned from our, our um, lesson that we had bottled a whole lot of honey thinking we were going to sell a lot for an event. And we sold about two thirds of it and the other third it crystallized in those one pound squeeze bottles. And I'm gonna tell you that was not, not fun to get those to uh, reliquify. Um, like Anita and Malcolm's little heating pad. If I'd have known about that, we'd have done that. That was a, a great idea. All right, so let's get to selling honey. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because we were kind of running long on time. Um, so selling your honey. If you're small scale, Really, the, some of this stuff is just bullet points that you can pack away in your head and you've got this easy stuff. Always keep some with you. Don't ever catch yourself going to the grocery store and running into that person that says, oh, I was going to call you the other day and get some honey from you. Stop them and say, hey, I have it with me. Let's go out to the car. Don't lose that sale. We carry honey with us. A little more difficult when you're in the, uh, when the wintertime with the cool cars like it is right now, but uh, you can also keep uh, we've got a heat box that we can keep ours in, but keep it with you at all times. Use Facebook and social media, Instagram. It's there. People are watching. I know there's a lot of you out there that are on Facebook, probably even doing it double duty right now and doing it well. You can absolutely promote yourself. We're in a world of love, your, love to help your fellow farmer, help your neighbor, keep things local, keep things going in our local environment. Take advantage of that, not in a bad way, but your, your friends on Facebook, they want to support you. So definitely take advantage of that. Take advantage of that. Your church, your social group, social clubs and friends, that they're your best, you know, they're your best advertisement. Tell them about it. I am amazed when I have known somebody for years and I find out that they make uh, handbags or they make some sort of a unique item. And I go, well, how come I didn't know about that? Had I known about that, I'd have been purchasing it from you. Make sure that these folks know. If they know, then they'll tell other people and they'll tell other people and they'll tell other people and you will make sales. Family, your biggest fans, you won't make any money off your family in case you didn't know that, but that's okay. They don't consume that much and they're well worth the amount of advertising they do just keeping them in honey. Um, we have done that for our entire duration of honey production. And I can assure you that my mother gets on Facebook often enough and tells everybody about our great honey and it pays off. So family are, are absolutely, absolutely there for you. The honey locator, I'm a big, big proponent of this one and the next one I'm gonna tell you about. This is through Texas Beekeepers Association, our state organization. I can't stress enough what I, how we feel about being members of this. It's I think 50 bucks a year. If you get in on the honey locator, you're gonna be one of these little dots that you see, one of these little bees. And there's so many in some of these areas that it's just got numbers. But as you zoom in, it'll break you down. Each one of you will have a bee. I, we have had, I don't, I'm gonna say hundreds of people traveling that would just Google honey near me and it would pull us up and they would literally stop, call on the way and say, can we stop? And they'd be from Dallas or, or Midland Odessa or Lubbock or wherever. And they're passing through, but they wanna try local honey. Utilize this. You do need to be a member of the Texas Beekeeper Association, but well worth it. I promise you, we have made our money, not only from being a member of Texas Beekeeper Association, but from honey sales as, as well. So this is also a nonprofit end of Texas Beekeepers Association. Very proud to say I was part of the original group that started with this program. Um, it's the Real Texas Honey Program. It is comes with a brochure. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, I think you can. Um, to become a um, listed on the Real Texas Honey locator map, you would 
join the program by going through realtexashoney.com and it is a landing page on the uh, Texas Beekeeper Association, but you'll get that label, see that silver label? And I showed you a picture, didn't mention it, but when I was talking about applying your labels before you fill your bottle, this is a gorgeous silver medallion. And it tells everybody that you are a real Texas beekeeper selling, selling real Texas honey. It's a huge selling point. And any level can be this. This is not just for small scale beekeepers. This is for all levels. Um, so take advantage of this and read about it. The brochure is great. They give you some brochures and uh, we give these away with to our new customers. And, and I promise this makes a difference. It really, really makes it makes you stand out from the rest because you got competition, just saying. Um, farmers markets and roadsides. There are plenty of farmers markets in towns. Uh, you'll want to check it out because they tend to have a limit to one honey uh, vendor or one tamale vendor or one candle vendor. So you'll want to get on the list if you have um, competition. Uh, roadside, of course, you can, if you've got somebody that'll let you sit on the side of the road, you can do that anytime. Um, but farmers markets, we've got friends um, up in the Northern Texas uh, area that they make a ton of money off selling their honey at farmers markets. So that's, that's good to know. Uh, marketing large scale. If you plan on going big, and I, I know that I know that someone out there is going to go big, there are huge opportunities for selling worldwide, really, with grocery stores. I'm going to make a suggestion. It's going to sound a little broad reaching that you reach out to someone that has done this in the market, that there, there are agencies that help people get in grocery stores. This is not just to go up to HEB or go up to Kroger and say, hey, I've got this great honey, can I put it on your shelf? There's more involved in that. Um, it's not a bad idea to pay someone to help you with that. And there are, all you need to do is Google, I wanna put my product on a grocery shelf and I promise you, you're gonna have a, a thousand or more um, opportunities pop up where companies that can well represent you um, also talk to other commercial level beekeepers and how they did it. Uh, store shelf, this is Blake's display in a grocery store. Um, store displays are, um, they're hard to get very much. When you go to a grocery store now, you see that, I mean, Lay's Chips, has a space this big and the store brand has a space this big. So it's not an easy market to get in, but it's doable. Blake's done it and many, many other beekeepers have done it. So you can do it. But uh, this is this is where you're gonna wanna go. I'll just go ahead and say, if you're, you're packaging 500,000 pounds of honey a year, you kind of need to make sure you're getting it sold, right? <laughs> so online sales will be your other and additional option. Online sales can be Amazon, Etsy, uh, eBay, in any of the online uh, spot. What's the other one? I can't remember it now. Spotify, is that right? Um, anyway, online service stores where you can just put it out there and, and customers can just literally just buy it, have it shipped to your, their home and they're good for the go. It's, it is absolutely a way to sell and reach all across the nation lots further than a little farmer's market or selling it out your front door. You definitely want to get in online sales. And this is another one of those areas that it's really easy to find out this information. In our long program, we've done this uh, in a traveling show. We go into details of how to seek out representatives to help you with learning these different aspects. It's not hard to find. I assure you, you can find those online of folks that are willing to help you learn how to do online sales. Very easy. Or you can just open your own store. How about do that? Just open your own store and you can sell your own honey and whatever products you want. It works, right? And then when you make so much honey, you need to sell it to people who make cereals or other food products, you know, um, nut grain bars and honey nut Cheerios, right? There's a beekeeper behind that somewhere that is selling volume honey so that those products can come to our table. Um, you could be that person. It is doable. Help, help yourself 
by finding someone that could be a mentor in that commercial area. There's a lot of commercial beekeepers out there. I know, wink, wink, that are very good and very willing to steer you in the right direction. Sometimes it's just a sentence or a phrase that says, go this way. Um, it, it absolutely will save you a lot of time and money if you can have at least a direction. My last slide of this, price your honey to what your market will bear. And I can't stress that enough. If you are going to be in the boutique, like what we talked about earlier with the Muth jar or the Skep jar, you want to be, that's that's a higher end and you should be able to garner anywhere from 10 to $15 a pound for that. But if you're more on the farmer's market or roadside stand or just passing it with church members and so forth, you're probably going to be a little lower on that, anywhere from eight to ten dollars a pound. But whatever your market or bear, don't leave money on the table, as my parents always said, don't leave money on the table, but also don't make it priced so high that you've got it sitting on the shelf doing what? Crystallizing. So really and truly, what your market will bear. Know your market. So this is where we started off, right? Know your market, pick your market, and go according to it. Pick your jars to do that, that fit that market. Pick your labels to fit that market. You wouldn't want a gingham label. If you're sitting in a highfalutin uh, boutique store, you're going to want to be more dressy than that. Might be lacy instead of gingham. Um, price it accordingly as well. So ah, last slide. So I've got to finish this by a shameless plug that since James and I are instructors for the Dayton Huffman area, we've got a new class schedule. It's coming in uh, starting January 16th. And I know the Blue Ridge location is starting um, in January as well, in person, y'all. We're gonna see you in person. Cannot wait. So you can uh, at checkout in store or go online to www.texasbeesupply.com and sign up for one of our classes. And I am going to find the stop share and give it back to play. We caught up on our questions, so we welcome. Hey, we sure did. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Sherry and James. I, I, I learned several cool things. I love, I love, love the heat lamp idea, keeping it at, uh, within the temperature of a beehive. That was awesome. Sherry, one thing I wanted to mention that uh, just happened, so I don't know if you saw it or not or have any insight into it, but it looks like the for Texas, the state health department just formally accepted um, the food cottage laws uh, so that if you produce less than 20 or if you're selling less than 2,500 pounds of honey a year, you don't have to have any licensing. So um, all that, and that I, makes it so much easier. Any, any logistics on that, but you're right, just saw that today actually. And then the new amended cottage foods, what you're referring to, if it's not got to be kept at a room temp uh, and a refrigerated or at a specific temperature, that you're good. So you're right. Right. Yeah. So honey's under cottage food on under 2,500 pounds and uh, you just don't have to do nearly as much as you used to. Fantastic. Well, guys, I hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful Christmas and I hope you will join us for January. We're going to be talking bees hot and heavy again in January as we gear up for the, the upcoming bee season. January starts getting exciting again. So and we're going to be doing these Zoom calls through the through the year. So we'll we'll continue them into next spring, next summer. And we'll keep you updated on everything you need to know as it's happening. So look forward to seeing everybody in January. Have a wonderful Christmas.